The boy Dub Deuce in the building. What up, what up, what up? It is that guy Dub, and I'm back with another video. How you guys doing at the end of the day? Tell I'm good money. Now, today, 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 you saying we got the brother in the building. What's going on, my brother Josh E. Robinson? What's happening, man? What's up, brother? Feeling, feeling, man. You saying that? You saying, right now, we we kicking off Super Bowl weekend. You say, first of all, let's get your pick out the way. Oh, man, look, and I, I ain't even watched. I probably watched maybe four downs of football this year, bro. I ain't even going to lie to you. Um, but if I got to pick a squad, I'm leaning towards San Fran, man. Okay. You uh, what's crazy is, you know what I'm saying, we get a, another historical, you know what I'm saying, uh, halftime performance, you said within Usher, you said him getting his flowers, you said while he's still alive. But it's crazy that it's been overshadowed by Taylor Swift. You said, I find that funny, don't you? See, I don't, I don't know if it's been overshadowed. I mean, this is something that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of attention going towards Taylor Swift, but Super Bowl happened. Like, I got it. No, nobody's really going. Oh, in. Right. To go out to Vegas to see the residency live. But I've seen, you know, a lot of clips and friends of mine that went out there. Like, we're in for a treat. I, like, I'm honestly tuning in just for the halftime show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, you said, like, we're going to give us a little bit of your background. You said you've done, you said wrestling, you said kickboxing. You said, look, you're pretty much a jack of all trades. You said, like, first of all, how did you get started? First, like you said, wanting to do all of the, all of those things because it's it's not easy to get into one of them, but you're into a lot of stuff. Yeah. So funny story, true story. Um, kindergarten class. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but uh, I had a teacher in kindergarten. You know, much like most kindergarten teachers, they go, uh, you know, tell me what you want to be when you grow up. At the mid '80s, late '80s. You know, so uh, I grew up on the Kung Fu theater, you know, I grew up watching, you know, uh, wrestling and all that stuff. And I, t <laughs> I said I wanted to be a professional football player. I wanted to be a pro wrestler. I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I I didn't accomplish being a Ninja Turtle, but I got the next closest thing, which is being, you know, in the martial arts <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, I think at uh, was it, like my sixth birthday, my, my mom signed me up for Taekwondo classes, which was uh, which was hard to do on the east side of Cleveland, man. It wasn't a whole lot of schools out there. There wasn't a whole lot of professors and things like that. So but my mom made it work. My dad made it work. You know, I was able to start training in Taekwondo at a young age. Um, my whole family's been in the football, you know, from shit. The, I, I want to say like the early 40s, you know, like my grandfather's played um, throughout their their career through like high school, college. Uh, so just sports in general has just been a big part of my life. And I never really got away from it. Uh, Cause I always it was like, man, I gotta stay active. I gotta stay active, you know. So the more active I was, the the better it was for me. Absolutely. absolutely. Now you said, with, when, what's the earliest that you can enroll children in? You said martial arts. Honestly, I believe the earlier the better. Especially now that I'm running a school myself, along with my uh, my partner and, and coach, uh, Mike Kazmarek. Uh, he runs the jujitsu program. I run the striking program. Um, I, I say get them in there as early as possible, as long as they're able to uh, communicate. So I think the youngest student I had was four, mm -hmm. uh, but he was a very advanced four year old. And what I mean by that is that he could he could talk. He could he could tell you, like, hey, I need to go to the bathroom or can you repeat that? I don't understand. You know, like he was very mm -hmm. smart for for being a four year old kid. He was he was really open to a lot of things. His parents were heavily involved in making sure that he practiced and drilled and, you know, he didn't goof off. I mean, every so often, you know, kids are going to be kids, dude. You get, 
five kids in a room, some some craziness is gonna happen. But to be able to have the the, the ability to snap back and, and get back on focus on task. Um, also, if your kid has a problem with that, I highly recommend you put them in a program as soon as possible. You know, uh, but I would say the earliest is, is probably like age four or five. You know, probably the same time you would start Pop Warner or something like that. Okay. Now, you said, like, when dealing with children, like, what are some of the challenges? Like, how, well, how do you personally get, like, like you just said, a group of four or five back in line when, like, excuse me, like one starts goofing off and they all want to play? Here's the thing. I, I've, I've noticed this amongst, amongst kid, like, uh, many kids uh, from all backgrounds, races, mixes, and creeds. Kids behave better when their parents aren't around. <laughs> like, so when you have the full backing of the parent to say, hey, do what you need to do, and then I become that, uh, you know, the, the authority person, they can't look to mom and dad to bail them out. This is like their first lesson in life to go, oh, man, if I don't act right, this dude's going to yell at me. Or if I don't act right, I'm going to have to, you know, squat in the corner or I'm going to have to do push-ups or I got to be held accountable <laughs> for my actions and like this is the first time they learn that so once we get the backing of the parents for that hour or 35 minutes 45 minutes because you know we still give them time to break so it's not a full hour of them just training they get their break times in there you know that 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 also sets that mentality and that adjustment to the oh, okay I gotta, I gotta mind my P's and Q's because coaches don't play you know I can play with mom I can play with dad to a certain extent but with coach, co- coach is going to snatch me up right away and have me be held accountable for what I've, what I've done, you know? Right. Now, this is a question I've always wanted to ask somebody personally because we used to, we see it online all the time. Now, you said that, like, how do you personally deal with, like, overzealous parents, like, when it comes to, like, a competition or what have you? Because you said, we've all seen the videos of, like, parents that do way too much. So how do you deal with that? Or how would you? Uh. The, well, I've had to deal with it multiple times, you know, throughout my coaching. Uh, best thing to do is to establish that right away and be like, hey, I get that you want your your child, your son, your daughter, you know, whatever. You you want them to be the best that they can possibly be. You want them to get all of the attention in the world, and I want to do that for them. But I can't do that if I'm hearing you, because now you're not only taking away from your own kid. You're taking away from all the other kids that are here uh, and those parents as well. So literally, you got to let the coach coach and let the parent parent. Now, at the end of the night, whatever you do when they leave that 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 dojo or that gym or whatever it is. Mm. Now you're the parent again. You know what I mean? But what I would ask them to do is instead of giving them the negatives or the hey, you should have or the you know, the what few questions did you have fun do you want to go back next week those are the only two questions you need to ask a child hey did you have fun today and do you want to go back right because then if they're having fun then whatever in your brain that you have planned out for your for your child doesn't matter at that point because they're developing their own skill set their own uh way about doing it and then that allows me to cultivate it to a better you know to better suit them To where when they do get older, you know, and they want to stick with it, now it's not something they were forced to do as a child. It's something they love to do growing up, and they're just going to want to keep doing it. Right. You said, like, another question is, like, um, what is the feeling that you get? Because we've all seen the videos of this, too, when a a young child is struggling, let's say, to break a board. And the coach is just, you you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And then the child finally breaks the board, and they're crying, all the friends are crying, and he's like, so what feeling does you say, like seeing one of your students cross that threshold into something that was difficult? Ah, it's like, for me, it's just a sign that what I'm doing matters. You know what I mean? Like, I take no pride or glory in the fact that uh, a child accomplished the goal. I'm just glad I was able to guide them to it. Like, I, I used to start off all my classes like, I'm just a guide, right? I'm a coach. I'm a guide. I'm not anything else other than that. It's up to you to, you know, to accomplish what you came here to accomplish. So if it's breaking a board or getting to the next rank or doing, 
that's on you. I can't force you to do it, and I can't give it to you. You have to earn it. Once it's earned, then it's yours. I can't take it back either. You know, you once you learn that knowledge, I can't take it back from you. I can't take it away from you. I can't take away that sense of gratification either uh, when it comes time for you to, you know, show what you've learned and, and to have your peers in that you're able to accomplish something that at one point seemed so difficult. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You said now, like, what you, you also, you said, been doing wrestling as well. You said, like, do you actually watch wrestling on TV or do you play the, uh, the, the games? Uh, I did for a very long time. Like, I watched a lot. Um, mainly now I watch just to study things. Uh, mm-hmm. I go back and watch a lot of old stuff um, or stuff that I, I want to explore more. Like if I found a clip of something, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go dive back into that and really take a look at who this person was, uh, you know, because as a fan, when I was watching, I was just a fan of that person. I was a fan of what they did, whatever. Now that I'm in it and this is like, uh, actually, this this next week coming up will be my 24th year in professional wrestling. Now that I'm 24 years in, I want to go back and see what hooked me as a kid. What did they do to hook me and get me emotionally invested in this person or this character? Because uh, that that's what that's what it really boils down to, you know. So it's like that's that's kind of where I'm at with it now. It's like let me let me find out, you know what. The macho man did back then and how it pertains to me now you know what i mean it's crazy because like you said kids today they don't you said they can look at the clips on youtube as we all can but they don't they don't get that nostalgia from in the early 90s and then the, the, the attitude era and you know, things like that what do you think that set you saying like the attitude era apart from what we're seeing now man i mean back then they weren't uh you know a corporately branded company they were still a very large uh promotion for that matter you know what i mean like now they got trademarks they got you know investors they got this merger thing going on like they got all these things you know that um now they're a corporation you know like wwe corp you know i mean it's no longer the wrestling federation that we grew up watching, you know, so attitude era, they had some leeway to get away with some things, push the button, push the line. Cause the only thing they were dealing with was, was TV. But what was on TV when we were growing up, you had Jerry Springer, you had Ricky, like you had all these wild talk shows and stuff like that. So they did nothing. They didn't do anything no different than what these shows were putting out. Uh, They just put wrestling as the backdrop, you know? Right. Because we're in such polarizing and political times, a lot of people, I mean, it's it's hard to pretty much do anything without somebody making it political. It's like, do you think that's a, a, a turn off? Because things uh, become so political? I, I don't think so. Um, I think gone are the times where uh, like my parents and grandparents used to say, like, you don't talk religion, you don't talk politics, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think those times have come and passed uh, because now it is such a thing where everyone's kind of sharing their viewpoints politically or, you know, their their beliefs or whatever it is that, you know, they stand on. Um, I think it gets a little oversaturated and overused. I think people try to make everything a political stance when it doesn't need to be you know if it's something that you stand on stand on it it doesn't have to be a movement everybody's trying to create these new movements and, and this new culture and it's like that ah, it's not it's not necessary you know uh, but yeah i don't think it's something that is a problem at this point right well professionally you said like anytime i've ever been around you you've been a, a consummate professional and he said, I just want to ask this from a standpoint. He said, because we both are cool with our brother, Lex Vegas. Now, when he gives you one of the chops to the chest, how do you stay in character and and not get mad? Because I've seen that shit. And I've seen some, it, people have some rosy you said, chest after Lex hit him. So how do you stay in character after that? 
uh, at the end of the day, you're doing a job, man. Like you're there to, to do uh, entertainment, and it's a physical entertainment. Um, yeah, you're gonna get mad, but that's the reaction you need to have when somebody slaps you in the chest. <laughs> like, uh, but I know, I know he wasn't doing it maliciously, uh, or maybe he was. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, you, you never really know. But at the end of the day, like somebody bought a ticket to watch you guys go out there and entertain for 15 minutes and it's a physical contest it's physical like you get chopped you get hit um but as long as it's not done in an unsafe manner i think uh i think you know you can kind of keep a cooler head about things and just know that it's all part of the entertainment it's part of the show right now you know with, with that is like um we we see all kinds of stuff like uh we learned all kind of terms throughout the years how do you, like, when it comes to like giving receipts, are you big on giving receipts or you, or you just going to let it ride and we're going to have a conversation after the match is over? Um, I like, so for me, that that's an old school terminology. I grew up in that era where it's like, you did something to me, I'm going to do it right back to you. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in that era when I came into wrestling. Like I said, I broke in in, in 2000. So that was that was rampant back then. You know what I mean? Like any little mistake, bro, you're getting your lunch eaten. Um, but I think now nowadays it's it's a little bit more calm. Uh, I know for me personally, you got a three strike rule with me. So if I give you the ease up twice, just know the third time you do something, I'm taking over, and then you're not gonna have a good night. And then when we get to the back, I'm going to explain to you what happened and why you no longer had a good night. Um, Because, like, again, at the same time, like, yeah, it's a show and it's entertainment, but I do this for real. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm really who I say I am. I'm not a character, um, you know, when it comes to what I can do inside of a ring or inside of a cage. Like, the skills are there. I just choose not to use them because we're telling the story. Now, if you no longer want to tell the story and you want to try to make a name for yourself, I'll expose you. So mm. I, I try I, I try to keep that in my mind and just let them know, like, look, whatever you heard or you think you know about me, don't. Let's just go out here, have a good show, and then we can get through it. Uh, and majority of the time, I've never really had an issue. Literally, the last time I had an issue with somebody in ring was, like, 2008. Oh, wow, it's been a real long time. You know, so, so it's been a real long time ago. And that just boiled down to somebody not wanting to do, you know, what the, what was asked of them. And I was put in a position where I had to basically save face. You know, it's like, you know, there's a reputation for the company and a reputation for me as a as a performer. Uh, and they were trying to take advantage of that, and I, I just had to, you know, I had to take over. But yeah, that was the only time I ever did it, and, I, and you never feel good about doing it. It's not something where it's like, oh, I can't wait till somebody mess up so I can, I can really hurt them. Like that, that's not, that's not what it is, dude. I need you to be as healthy as possible, just like you need me to be as healthy as possible, because this is how we make our money. If I'm not right. there to, you know, to wrestle you, and you're not there to wrestle me, then what are we doing? You know, like yeah. We'll, we'll have no, you know, we'll have no show at that point. So, well, you said, have you ever dealt with you said, an opponent with you said, that uh, has a, a, a specific finisher that you were like, oh hell no, I'm not, I'm not fighting him. It is because his, his, let's say his finisher is kind of dangerous. Uh, I mean, everything's done within context. I don't have a whole lot of rules uh, about like maneuvers and things like that. I, I, I pretty much let people know right off the rip. I'm like, hey, anything that's going to have me fall on top of my head, we're not doing. I don't care if that is your finisher or not. Um, it's for my safety. I'm not saying that you can't do it safely. I'm saying I can't do it safely. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like, I'm letting you know it's going to look bad if I do it because I'm self-conscious about it because I broke my neck once. Oh, wow. And, you know, so I'm... I'm I am still cautious to this day, even though it's damn near ten years later. Uh, I, it's just something that I'm not I'm not comfortable doing, you know. But I'm pretty open to pretty much like I'm like, 
we can do whatever, man. It's fine. But those are the one things I do try to avoid. Sorry about that, brother. Oh, okay, I was like, oh, man, he dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still here. It's just, uh, well, with that being said, it's like, let's say you had a move that you, that you do. Is there, has anybody ever said that to you, that a move that you do is off limits to them? Yeah, I've had a few. You know, like, hey, but again, it, it, it usually boils around the other person's safety and mm-hmm. that's why i like i'm like hey man that's cool we can go a different route you know what i mean like the worst thing you can do is to say yeah i'll do it and then if you get hurt you then go oh i i didn't want to do that in the first place and now you you know you're trying to play the victim and play play the bad guy, or you know play the you know the martyr and have me look like mm-hmm. the bad guy and it's like, man, we could have discussed it. You know what I mean? Like, there's other ways to, to do this. You know what I mean? There's more than one way to get to the end of the story. You know what I mean? Like, we don't have to necessarily have this be the way we end it. Um, so I try, like I said, I, I try to be as open as possible. I try to be as easy as possible. Um, but if someone doesn't voice, you know, voice something right away and then try to do it later, then that's on you. I, I, I don't take any sympathy on that. Right. Okay. So you said another question I had was, um, let's say you said you're coming to a, an event and the, the person you're supposed to wrestle is, for whatever reason can't make it last minute, but you still, they still want to put on a show. So they basically throw you in there with somebody that you've never performed with before. How do you, you said, how, how do you readjust from what you came in thinking you were going to do into still putting on a good show? So there's this uh, there's this thing at the bottom of every flyer, like every wrestling flyer that you'll ever see. It says cards subject to change. So I go in not believing nothing until the bell rings. <laughs> like, I don't I don't, I mean, just this past weekend, I was supposed to go up to Michigan and wrestle. And at one point in that day, I thought I wasn't going to be able to make it up there. Uh, I got I got stuck with some car trouble. And I'm sitting there messaging the promoter like, hey, man, it looks like I might, might not make it, you know, like and it's day of hours before I need to be there. You know what I mean? So and with me being one of the main attractions, you know, that puts a dent in the show. You know, um, fortunately, I was able to get out of that sticky situation, get there, you know, right before doors open and still put on a, you know, put on a performance. But I mean, everybody has those close calls, man. Like I, I remember times like, I was driving to Cincinnati. We got a carload of guys, dude, and uh, the car breaks down. You know, so we had to call somebody to come get us. And there was six of us in a Ford Cam- or in a, in a Camaro <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> on, on our way down to Cincinnati. You know, uh, and we made it happen. But on the way back, it was like we got to deal with this car situation. You know, so stuff like that happens all the time. Um, the biggest thing is, is just, you know, rely on your skill set. So, I mean, half of the time when you, when you go into a show, you're probably wrestling somebody you've never wrestled before, or, you know, somebody you're just meeting for the first time that day. Very rarely do I get to wrestle any of my friends, you know what I mean? Like people that I know, um, mainly because we're just so scattered about, you know, so like we're all over the place. So it's like, oh, my friend's at this show. So I'll probably be wrestling somebody over here that I've never met before, you know? Okay, this is something I definitely want to get off my chest and ask you. You say, what was it like with the uh, the black you said trio? Because I know I had a shirt that said "Black Wrestlers Matter," and uh, you said, anytime I wore that shirt, Mofo was pissed when I had oh, that yeah. shirt. That, at that time, this was the hot button. This was 2015, 2016. So this was like a right at the beginning of the BLM movement. Uh, or you know whatever you want to call it, because um, but back at that time there was there was some you know term, turmoil, right? Everything was starting to heat up, mm-hmm. and uh, to the credit of a friend of mine, uh, he was like, "Hey man, I want you guys to be you know a really big heel tag team. I want you guys to really push the button and ruffle the feathers." And I was like, "Well, 
hey, I've done this before, <laughs> uh, just years prior. Mm-hmm. So, and I want to say like 2006, 2007, I had a tag team of three black dudes called BET. We're a black entertaining tag team. Okay. Uh, and we got it to the point to where we had a group of people from Alliance, because that's where we were wrestling at. And if you guys are familiar with Alliance, Ohio, it's probably not the most culturally diverse place in the world, but at it all. is what it is. Uh, we got them to throw fried chicken at us. Wow. Uh, and for probably about four years straight after that, they would chant KFC at, uh, during any one of our matches. So if any one of the three of us peeked our head through that curtain, you would hear roars. I'm, I'm not talking about just chanting. I'm talking about an armory full of three to 400 people roaring B E or uh, KFC anytime we did anything in the ring. Wow. So when it came time for me to do this with, you know, my brother Lex and, and my brother Jackson, I was like, hey, I got the blueprint. It's just how far do you want to go with this? <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was at a gas station. I was getting gas, and I go into the gas station so I could, after I pump my gas, I went in and get a cup of coffee, and this white man comes up behind me. He's like, really? That shirt? Really? I was like, dude, did you read the damn shirt? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that shirt was meant to raise eyebrows. And and again, at 2016, we were, st- like, in the wrestling world, we were still trying to make that – like you said, back at, like go back to what we were saying earlier. We were trying to make a political statement about wrestling in 2016. Uh, gone are the days of, of us being, uh, you know, a hip hop star or, uh, you know, the shucking and jive type, you know, wrestler that we grew up watching. Like there, we're, we're not Virgil. We're not, you know. Although these guys blazed the pathway for us, and I'm not knocking any of them because I respect every last one of them uh because without them i wouldn't have an opportunity to be a pro wrestler you know but we wanted to make that stance like no i i don't have to be you know shucking and jiving to be entertaining i don't have to be a thug or militant to be entertaining so in our group you had you know jackson who was the uh, you know the bama bully you know he came in doing doing his thing you had Lexus kind of the pretty boy, you know, and then you had me who just people couldn't figure out. And I was like, I want to keep it that way. I don't want you to know anything about me. Like, you know what I mean? Like it gave you this weird dynamic, you know? So it, it was something that we were trying to make a political stance on that way as well. You know? Absolutely. Now you said like, you're really big into like using mental health. You said you, you've done you said the men's health summit and the women's health summits. You said multiple times. You said how big, and especially in this day and age, is you said dealing with your own mental health and your mental traumas. You said how, how important is that? Ah, uh, man, it's huge. It, it's it's so huge, um, especially for me. You know, um, like I said, I've, I've told my story multiple times, and I'll keep telling it because the more I tell it, the more the shame dies. Right? I don't let the I don't let the shame grow, grow and grow and grow to where I can't, you know, I, I don't want to talk about it. But uh, I, I would say, like, you know, mid mid 2011 was the first time I tried to commit suicide. Um, so it, it's something that for me, I had to learn what my triggers were, the things that do get me depressed, the things that do make me spiral. Um and and not be afraid to ask for the help and that's the biggest thing is asking for help um even though you don't want it especially sometimes you get in those those modes man and it's just like dude i just don't want to be around anybody i don't want to be near anybody what i learned is that you still need those people to at least check up on you because when you look back at it they're like okay they were there even when i didn't want them to be so they truly do, you know, look out for me. They have love for me in some kind of form or fashion. You know what I mean? So it's like stuff like that. Like, you know, you, you got to appreciate. Uh, also, I, I'm glad I wasn't successful, you know, um, looking back at it as well, because now I do have this experience in this platform and the responsibility 
to share my story and hopefully it helps somebody else, you know, and keep my door open and never shut anybody out who might be going through it. Um, Cause I mean, I still struggle, but at the same time, there's somebody who's not where I am, you know, yet. So if I can pull somebody up to where I'm at and then I can reach up and somebody can pull me to where they're at, we just got this constant chain where we're just lifting each other up. Right. Now, I always see some crazy stuff on it on the internet. We all know the internet's undefeated. It was a meme that I thought was pretty harsh. It was just it said, uh, "I'm here to help you with your you said your mental health, but your triggers are not my problem." And I thought that was kind of it's like it almost sound like an oxymoron statement. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's a better way to say that, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I am here to help you, but um, basically what I'm getting out of that is like, you need to understand what your triggers are and and work on those um, because I can't help you. You know, no one can help me with what my triggers are. I get triggered, I'm triggered, you know what I mean? There's nothing that you could do that, you know, my mom could do, my dad, like there's nothing that anybody can do about what triggers me. I just need to know, okay, that triggers me. And I need to be more conscious of how I respond to it. Um, if that means I got to not be around it, then I'm not around it. If that means I have to cut somebody off that triggers me, that means I cut them off. I don't do it out of spite or hate or anger or anything else. I'm doing it out of the sure just, hey, man, I, I can't be around you right now because mentally I can't handle it. Uh, I left jobs for that reason. You know what I mean? Like. If I'm sitting here at work and the first thing I'm I'm not thinking about the the job, I'm thinking about everything else that I, I want to be doing in my life. And then I get depressed that I'm not doing those things. And then, you know, I get in this snowball of just going downhill. Then that's not good for me. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I, I So it's like I, I've I've left jobs that way. You know, I've I've had to leave people behind. I mean, it's just it is what it is, you know, Um but again, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it to be mean or vindictive or anything like that. It's just, you know, I got to sometimes be selfish when it comes to your mental health, you know. So, yeah, the knowing your triggers and, and handling them it is key. Um, but if, if someone's there to help you, you know, yeah, they can help you. But don't expect them to be able to oh, you know, you shouldn't get mad at that. Like, you can't tell me how to act. You know, you can't tell me how to react to something. Like, those kind of things are, are different. You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to deal with. Uh, it's hard being a mentor to somebody that's like that. Like, when you see their trigger, and you're like, man, uh, I can't even tell you, you know, hey, stop doing that, you know, because that's a, that's a major part of your life. All I can say is like, hey, man, th- this seems to be a common denominator. Maybe you should explore that, you know. Absolutely. Now, in your opinion, if like you you knew somebody that needed some help, or you and like their go to rebuttal was like, "I can't afford it. I can't afford it. I can't afford it." How do you then proceed in the conversation? Uh, anybody, the conversation's free. You can talk to anybody. You you can go to a trusted source. You can go to somebody. Uh, even if you don't feel like you have somebody that you can go to. I mean, just reach out, man, because you never know who who you have at your resources. You never know who you have at your fingertips. Like, I got a lot of friends that never knew about, you know, my 2011 suicide attempt. I got a lot of friends that don't know about, you know, the three more after that. You know (laughs) know what I mean? Like, but until, like, I had that conversation, then they pulled me to the side. Like, damn, dude, I didn't didn't know, you know. And then they, oh, how'd you get through this or how'd you do that? You know, so you never really know until you until you reach out so i I, i'd say you know look at your you know your friends around you look at the resources you have around you and a conversation's free man i'm like i don't charge people to talk you know like you don't charge people to talk like i'm not charging you for this conversation man you hit me up and say hey man can you come on the show let's make it work let's make something happen you know like anything like that uh it doesn't cost money now when like medication and shit like that i understand (laughs) you know what i mean like that's something that you know is unavoidable you can't really help that out but at least being able to know in a time of crisis or in a time of need if i can pick up a telephone 
or if I can drive over to your house, or if I can FaceTime you, or if I can, you know, whatever it is, that is a major step in the healing journey and the learning journey of taking care of yourself mentally, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> now, what do you think with that being said, because a lot of people, like, especially like women, you think like, Especially now, they said, saying, well, you, need to, you need to talk to somebody. He said, it's, it's not the same as it was back in the day. And then we, we sit there and be like, well, we talk to our guys. We talk to our guys, you know, whatever, whatnot. Well, that's not, no, you need to talk to somebody professional. It's like, it's almost like no matter, well, you know, like with certain people, like no matter what you say, they, you said they've always got a one up. You try to prove their damn yeah. point. You said, like, when somebody's saying that to you, how do you as a man handle that? You're like, yo, I'm talking to my guy. No, you need to talk to somebody professionally. Uh, I was like, and I, I address it. Hey, maybe you're right. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I do need to talk to somebody professionally. But for right now, I'm not there yet. Mm. Right? It's just like telling the alcoholic, "Yo, you need to go to AA." I, you know what? I'm, you're probably right. I need to go do something about my drinking, but I'm not there yet. You know what I mean? Like, mm. you can't twist somebody's arm into doing and in, into doing something. Um, and sometimes maybe that setting isn't the best setting for them to let it out. Mm. You know, um, I know my the doctors weren't it. You know, they're medicine people. You know, we come from a tribe of medicine people. So they, they remedied themselves, you know. So it was like you went to the doctor if something was broken. You didn't go to the doctor just cause, you know what I mean? Like, and even when it was broken, if it was fixable at home, guess what? Put these two popsicle sticks together and we're going to be all right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I mean, the way I address something like that is, is literally like, Hey man, maybe you're right. I'm just not at that level yet. I'm not ready to, to, to sit on somebody's couch and dive deeper. Um, I mean, I have my own process now. I have sat on someone's couch it wasn't for me. I didn't feel like they were truly listening. I felt like they were there just collecting, you know, their hourly fee, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I had one psychiatrist that I talked to that gave me all the tools that I use now. And that was the one person that I truly had a connection with. And I felt was like, okay, they're, they're really trying to help me. Uh, unfortunately, with insurance changes and stuff like that, I can no longer go to that doctor just because, you know, they don't take the insurance or whatever it is. But I still use a lot of what was taught to me um, from that. So, yeah, maybe I do need to go back and talk to somebody professionally or get a second opinion or whatever the case may be. But for right now, I'm in a space where I'm I'm good. I'm in a good space. And I'm going to continue to work on the things that were given to me. And, and until it completely fails and I feel myself spiraling out of control again, you know, I don't, I don't see the need, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just address it right away and, and just let them know, like, Hey man, I'm not that far in that journey yet. You know? He said, now we're, just, like, we're going to switch back to uh, children because he said, one thing I also try to do on my platform is uplift children and he said, so help them navigate through this thing we, we got called life now with everybody being on social media. He said, a lot of times children cannot handle the comment section. So, it, because the comment section can be extremely ugly. Now, you know, how do you sit keeping children out again and so to ha help them deal you said, with potential bullying, especially in the comment section? Yeah, I mean, I had, you know, my daughters are a little older now, but, you know, they, I, I tried to shield them away from social media as much as I could. Um, but even with some of the students that I deal with and things like that, I got to You got to remind kids that comments are just those. They're just comments. These people that are commenting are making a prejudgment on you based on whatever the content was. Um, and they're they're posting an opinion and opinions really don't matter when it when it boils down to you know what the truth is or what what you're trying to accomplish or whatever you know that post was like my my youngest daughter she's big into art and for the longest time she was afraid to post her art because she was afraid of what people might say about it mm -hmm. and i'm like whatever they say about it doesn't matter it's what your art says to people 
So if someone takes it the wrong way, well, that's just their way of taking it. But your intent was what your, you know, your story was what, you know, and, uh, and it's hard. Like it, it is really hard. It's much harder now for kids than it was for when you and I were growing up because the comment section was in your face and then you could deal with it right then and there. <laughs> you know? right. Back in our day, it was like, man, you, you a booty scratcher. Like what? Like, you know what I mean? Like it was like, it was on, you know, now, you know, they get to hide behind these keyboards and be nameless, faceless people. And it could be somebody that's just trolling. They don't even know you from nobody. You know what I mean? And they sitting there talking, oh, you suck. You're this, you're that. And you're like, who is this person? You know, it could be a bot. You don't even know now, you know, with this new AI technology, bro. Like you can't, you can't take anything seriously in the comment section, uh, especially at this point, you know? Um, so I try to remind kids, like, it doesn't matter what people say or what people's opinions are. It, it matters on how you react to those things and what you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. Now you said you just mentioned AI and stuff like that. You said like I've been I saw a commercial the other day and it was a uh, basically an AI call calling a father, but it sounded like his daughter, and it needed you said uh, like, I guess a thousand dollars. You said for whatever reason, he was like. Like, how dangerous do you think this AI thing is going to get before they actually regulate and get it on track? Uh, it's already too dangerous. I don't think they I don't think they really understand what this this uh, technology is going to do. Um, I already think it's too dangerous. Um, this is why I tell my kids all the FaceTime me. I don't want you to text me. I don't want you to. I want to see your face. I want to see your lips move. And you say the words, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if I can't be with you face to face for a conversation, I want you to turn your little camera on and talk to me, you know, uh, until they know how to clone your face on a camera. Then, uh, you know, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. But be, having your voice be able to be used for any kind of recording, for having anything typed out, you know, like and, and it come from your account and you ain't have nothing to do with it. It's 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 extremely dangerous, man. It's it, it, it it's something that you know. What was the purpose of AI being created? I don't really a hundred percent know. Mm. And and then for it to evolve into something like this, like I said it's already too dangerous, man. It's already too dangerous. Right. Using I, I usually try to stay away from politics on my uh, my platform, but it was I guess uh in I guess Delaware or whatever. <laughs> They did an AI call to a bunch of you know, constituents in Delaware, sounding like President Biden. Oh yeah, yeah, I heard that one on the radio myself, and I was like, "It's kind of close. It could have been him. It could have been a robot. We never know. You know what I mean?" So it's like, but if you're not expecting that, and you just answer your phone, and then you hear the president's voice on a pre-recorded message, you're kind of like, "Yo, what the hell?" You know what I mean? Like, so I mean this. This is like the, after this election year, bro, like you really can't you can't trust anything coming off of a computer screen unless you tangibly hold it in your hands. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like bring, bring me back to analog, bro. Yeah, I, want, I, want, I want I want a tape deck, an eight track. Like <laughs> I want some vinyl. I want I want some stuff I can hold. <laughs> and said it's like. He said, like, I got a lot of DJ friends, and he said, like, a lot of them, they, they like to use Serato, and you send it to uh, the virtual DJs, and I mean, they like, you know, stuff like that. But I, there's nothing better to me when I see a DJ doing their thing on vinyl. You know, so this is, yeah. this is, it, oh my goodness, it's, because it, the mixing and the blending is, is, is so much different when you're doing it on vinyl than when you're doing it you're saying, like on a, a digital platform. You know, just like, yeah, because yeah, you got you to gotta have the speed, the precision, the know-how, the savvy to make it all work, you know? So, it's like, that in itself is an art form. Oh, you yeah, definitely. You know, it's like, now, with us being like, you saying we just passed 50 years in hip hop. You saying like how important has hip hop been to your life? Ah man, it's a soundtrack. <laughs> like it's truly a soundtrack. Like there's different ranges of hip hop that, you know, meets different ranges of your life, man. Like there's parts of it. Anytime I hear the ghetto boys come on, the first thing I think about is cleaning my room on a Saturday morning with my brothers. You know what I mean? <laughs> like 
uh, Domino, you know, Domino comes on, I'm sitting there vacuuming, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's just like, anytime I hear anything old school like that, if I hear Run DMC, like, I'm thinking back to where we used to go down to Tower City and break dance for change, you know what I mean? Like, right. It's it's like there's it's a time machine, you know. What I mean, hip hop is a time machine, at least for me, because I, you know, I've been around for the, for the most part of it. You know what I mean? Like, I got it, especially in the boom. Yeah, you, know, you know, my brothers are I got brothers older than me, so it was always around. So I can my some of my earliest memories, you know, back early '80s, mid '80s, whatever it was, like hip hop was king you know what i mean like my dad my brother would come home with a new tape every every weekend like oh you gotta hear this oh you gotta hear that you know oh check this out this is a new one from kumo d you know this one hey ice cube split from the group and he made this and it was like oh shoot you know what i mean like so i mean music in general you know but hip-hop for sure has been the story storytelling of my my life because almost there's there's probably something that you can relate to in almost every hip-hop song uh mm -hmm. that you hear on the radio at some point in your life you're gonna you're gonna relate to it and you're gonna go back and you're gonna hear it and you're gonna be like damn i do remember that <laughs> you know what i mean like right. right like now man scarface when his scarface tiny desk was a time throwback to me where i'm sitting there i'm like wow bro like now these lyrics are really, really hitting. You know what I mean? Like back then, I was like, okay, that's smooth. I like that, whatever. Now I'm sitting back listening to it. And I'm all like, damn, being a father, you know, going through those emotions, those turmoils and all that, the mind playing tricks on me. Like, psh, bro, it hit too hard now, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, you said it's like, I was watching a Vlad TV interview with uh, Michael Jai White. And it was uh, Michael J. White had a, a show nuff t shirt on. And he said, I'm a huge Barry Gordy Glass Dragon fan. I, I love that movie. One of the, he said, one of my oh, favorite yeah. movies of all time. And uh, my son happened to be looking over my shoulder and asked me who that was on, on his shirt. So it was, I thought it was dope to be able to take my son down, he said, memory lane to, to explain to him who show nuff was. And then yeah. he's actually probably going to watch the movie today after the Super Bowl. It just, it, 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 like, because when our parents were teaching us, we didn't really understand it then. But then once we became parents and now we get to have, to have those same walks and talks with you and with our children, it's, just, it's like it's almost like life coming full circle. And I just I can only speak for myself. But it's just like it's like a, almost like a sense of pride that I get being able to teach my children something that I grew up on. Because, you know, kids, for what are they think, they think uh, when they were born, you saying we're this old. Usually like these are the same, you know what I mean? And it's just like, <laughs> it's one of those, like I said, it's just one of those things. So like, how do you feel and how do you deal with you said, teaching your children, you said, everything that you went through? Uh, it's it's a harder lesson because uh, I got girls, you know, I got two girls. Um, so I didn't get a lot of time with them, with them, with them growing up. So the time I do get, I try to put those nuggets and wisdoms in their ear and share with them certain things. Um uh me and my youngest have a really tighter bond we spent a little bit more time together than me and my oldest so for for me and my youngest you know kung fu movies uh anime uh art you know stuff like that like you know i was able to introduce her to that and now she's introducing me to some new stuff you know what i mean like so like that's really cool you know our love for video games and stuff like that like I was able to share that with my daughters and my youngest gravitated towards it. You know, my oldest was kind of like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Dad, you're old, you know, like, <laughs> uh, and she kind of had her own thing, which is fine. You know what I mean? Which is like, I don't, I had to learn not to, um, you know, put my hopes and dreams of how I want them to be and just support their hopes and dreams of what they want to be. You know what I mean? So, um, but it was always cool, you know, sharing little bits and pieces of information with them um, regarding, you know, just family history, my history, uh, things that I did growing up versus, you know, things that, you know, they'll never be able to uh, to experience just because the times have changed, you know. And my dad did the same thing with me. I, I remember, uh, you know, sitting in the car with him and listening to certain songs and things like that, that, you know, would 
he played on the radio, you know, when he was in high school or, you know, whatever it was like. So it was like, it was really cool to, to kind of share those moments. Yeah, absolutely. You so like, we grew up on, you said, my pops, you said, Parliament, Funkadelics, the Gap Band, all the kind of stuff like that. It was like, I just remember, you said, my brother calling me, you said, because uh, he got invited to, I guess, hang out backstage because he's a DJ in Atlanta. And uh, George, uh, said George Clinton in Parliament, you said, we're actually performing. And my brother got to meet George Clinton. He said, like, he was like, like to basically telling me it was like the most, one of the most greatest moments of his life because we grew up. He said, he like, because Pops was like every Saturday morning, it was like, if it wasn't like early 90s hip hop, it was like Parliament Funkadelic, the Gap Band. You said, like, SOS. Oh, 100%, dude. Like, uh, I, I missed out on my opportunity to meet Bootsy Collins by like 15 minutes. Like 15 minutes. If, if we didn't stop, like I would have been able to meet Bootsy Collins because uh, he was shooting a music video with New Jack down in Cincinnati. And we were on our way to go wrestle for New Jack. And he was like, he kept telling us, he was like, man, y'all better come on. Y'all better come on. We're like, we're hurrying, we're hurrying. You know what I mean? And we took one stop. And and when we got there, he was like, y'all done missed the shit now. We were like, what? What's going on? And he showed us the music video. And I was like, oh, man. Like, just missed out on meeting Boosie Collins. But not the same, dude. Like, you know, if it wasn't, you know, for, for my dad introducing us to that kind of stuff, man, you know, we never, never would have known nothing about it, you know, so. And it was just like one of those things, like, I... I've actually been able to have one of those moments on, you said, my show, you said, it was like, what? every, you said, every time I put out a show, you said, every guest I have is amazing, and you said, it's like, but I had one guest where I used, it was a sense of nostalgia because I grew up in Atlanta in the 90s, and you said, Freak Me was the, the thing, you said, like, it's crazy. I actually was able to have you said, uh, Brother Marquise from Two Live Crew on my show, so you said, I was able to you said, feel that as well. Mm. You said, it's like, and it was like, super dope. He's a super cool guy. You said it's actually you said I've been talking to him, and I want to get some me and some of my other guests you said together so that way we can you said tap it up you said, and do things like that's something I'm, I'm working on. And you said just if I can get everything together, I definitely you said, want to include you. You said in something like that if you're interested. Oh, a hundred percent, man. Like uh, I'm all for meeting the people that kind of shaped, like, again, like I said, they shaped our, our way of life. They were very instrumental in putting our cultures on the map. You know what I mean? Like I got a chance to meet Doug Williams for the first time this past, uh, over the summer and just seeing him and going like, yo, you are the reason we have two black quarterbacks in the NFL and, 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 you know, in a Super Bowl game, you know what I mean? Like you're you're that reason. You're the first one to do it. And you trade, you know, it, it was just cool to, to shake his hand and meet him and just like, thank you. Thank you for everything, all the sacrifices you made, bro. Cause like if it wasn't for you, we'd we'd still be looking at, you know, the John Elways of, of the world plant quarterback position, you know. So Yeah, and it's, I mean because like I said, uh bringing back up Vlad, and right now he's got a uh, he said Michael Vick on. And you said Michael, you know, I've met Michael Vick before as well, but you said it's like you really don't understand, you said like you said what that does for us. You said it's like even back in like two thousand and eight, you said when Barack Obama was running, you said like what that did for our coach because we weren't able to attain those things. You know what I'm saying? It's like Yeah. And you like that you said other people, they just like, Oh, you said and to them, it's like no big deal, but you said they've already ha had all those and been able to, to achieve those accolades. So they didn't, a lot of them didn't understand and still don't understand, you said, what that does, you said, to our self esteem or to our, you said, our motivations and things like that. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's almost like they, they want to tell us to shut up you said, and just think their way. But when we don't think their way, we're the one that's cheap because we're not thinking like them. Right. Like I think is that. Like, stupid concept within itself <laughs> yeah i mean it, it just goes back to like do what i tell you to do and if you don't do what i tell you to do then you're the wrong you know you're in the wrong you know so it's mm -hmm. like it, it, it is something hard to navigate through and and these guys did it like you said the michael vicks of the world the doug you know the um the the barack obamas of the world they were able to pull something off that seemed impossible you know now now that those doors have opened, those doors have clicked, 
you know, it's possible. Now we just got to be a little bit more savvy about doing it because they now know that, hey, man, this thing is it's open for for anybody to grab. So it's going to be protected a lot harder now, you know. So you got you might have to work just a little bit harder to get there, but you can still get there. Absolutely. <clears throat> You said now before we get up out of here, you said get every, give everybody your social so they can get in contact with you and also let them know what you got coming up. Yeah, man, social media. I I mean I don't really have a personal one. I got my 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 wrestling one, which is under chosen underscore em. Uh, my Facebook's just Josh E Robinson. Like I said if you need somebody to talk to, just inbox me, um, and I can I can try to help you as best I possibly can. Um, Dragon FS uh, on Instagram is the striking program that I run. Uh, Team Zenith Ohio is the jiu-jitsu program that I'm a part of. Uh, we're located in Bidoff Plaza uh, over in, in Brooklyn. Um, kids are welcome. It's a whole family event, dude. Like every, I, I recommend it for the whole family. Uh, Self-defense for the whole family, especially in this day and age. I don't care if you're male, female, whatever you identify as you need to be a part of something that that can teach you a skill set to at least protect yourself and get you to a surviving point like you can survive uh, in a situation um cuz you're not going to always have you know tools at hand uh in certain situations so learn learn to use your body as as what it's meant to do which is protect you know your body's full of all these little protection points um, so I highly recommend you guys come check it out. And the first two classes are free. You get two free classes, bro. I'm not trying to, you know, go at your throat right away. Um, right. and we're probably the most affordable school in the area. Uh, I said the average in the area is $135 a month. We're coming wow. in well below that, depending on what you want to do, you know, so we kind of cater it towards your needs. Um, but yeah, man, I, all, all that information is up on the socials. Um, Coming up, you know, I'm about to go in here and get some training in uh, on a Sunday. Uh, I'll be opening up a mentoring program for pro wrestlers. I'm not, I'm not training anybody. Don't, don't, don't say that I'm training you. I'm just mentoring guys uh, a couple days a week to kind of help them get to the next level um, or, or just increase their visibility or cr- increase their skill set. So I'll be doing that throughout the week as well um i said we got some wrestling shows that'll be popping up here pretty soon i'm about to go in here and get some more details so just you know check the social media man and and uh, we'll keep everybody informed absolutely absolutely well with that being said if you guys like this video make sure you smash that like button turn on that bell notification so you don't miss another video now without further ado i love you we didn't even mention him. little dub loves you joshy robinson loves you man we out of here man peace peace The boy Dub Deuce in the building.